Hi, this is Dr. Ross, and I'm going to be narrating this short set of PowerPoint slides that serves as an introduction to the digestive system, which is the next system we're um, covering in Anatomy and Physiology 2, and this is for both mine and Dr. Camp's classes. So the digestive system, of course, is the system within our body used to um, to take in and digest food, uh, ultimately breaking it down into nutrients so that those can be absorbed into the body. Um, and we're going to talk about those functions in a little more detail as we move through this set of uh, slides as well as the others. Um, so gastroenterology, as it says here, is the study of the digestive system. Uh, some of you may be aware that sometimes the system is also referred to as the gastrointestinal system. The digestive system has uh, four major functions or four functions that we can easily divide the digestive system into. The first one listed here is ingestion. Ingestion, of course, is just taking food into the body, and this, occur this occurs at the, um, at the uh, ve oral vestibule and the oral cavity. Uh, the next function is digestion. Digestion is actually uh, the breaking down of food, and this can be referring to either chemical, chemically breaking down the food using things like enzymes uh, or, or acid, uh, as well as the uh, mechanical, mechanically breaking down food, uh, which can be done uh, by physically, um, physically interacting with the food. And of course, uh, chemical and mechanical digestion occur throughout the GI. It occurs in the mouth, uh, the stomach, the small intestines, and there's assistance from some other accessory organs that we'll discuss later on in this presentation. Of course, once we break food down into nutrients, the body needs to absorb it. So the GI, GI um, system will function in absorption. This mainly occurs. Uh, in the small intestine. Of course, whatever part of those nutrients or, or what part, whatever part of the, the um, food that we take into our body that does not get absorbed uh, is, is going to be um, expelled from the body as waste, uh, and this is going to be called excretion. So these four general functions of the digestive system um, are assisted by some accessory or secondary functions, which are listed here, secretion, mixing, and propulsion. Secretion refers to the secretion of enzymes, uh, which are going to serve in chemical digestion of food. Mucus, which is largely going to protect um, the digestive system, as well as help with lubrication and then also a secretion of other digestive fluids. Mixing, of course, is another important secondary function. Uh, these enzymes and fluids that are secreted are not going to do their job efficiently if they are not properly mixed uh, with the food um, that is moving through the system. So you only get partial digestion if you don't have uh, thorough mixing. Finally, of course, we need our food or our partially digested food to move consistently through the GI tract. Uh, and so that process is called propulsion. It's just a propulsion of food or partially digested food through the GI tract. Now to perform these functions, the digestive system has specialized organs. And we divide these organs into two categories. One set of organs, are organs that, that food and its digestive remnants actually pass through. And this makes up what's called the gastrointestinal tract, which is also known as the alimentary canal. Now, the, um, the alimentary canal or digestive, um, the gastrointestinal tract is actually about 25 feet long from mouth to anus. And um, it's going to be modified uh, to fit the function of the body. So as you move through this canal or this alimentary canal, you're going to find different, uh, what we would call different organs. And these are just different modifications that fit the function um, that needs to occur in that part of the digestive system. Like other tracts in our body, this one is a series of hollow organs uh, with various concentric layers. Um, and this, of course, is open to the outside world, and that means it has to be protected. And, and since this has uh, to absorb and secrete, it's not going to be protected with really thick layers like our, um, like our integument. Instead, it's going to be protected by a mucous membrane. 
However, it does have some differences to the other tracts in our body. Um, the GI tract is open on both ends, so there is only one way of movement from in to out. So compare this to the respiratory system where you have movement of air in and out of uh, the lungs and the airway, uh, but it's only going to go through one opening. Uh, this is not how it is with the GI tract. The GI tract, of course, is exposed to um, many harsh digestive enzymes as well as harsh chemicals, so uh, it is going to be well protected by that mucus layer uh, to keep from damaging itself as it tries to digest our food. The GI tract is also segmented into regions with different functions, uh, as I mentioned, and that's going to give us different varied micro and macro structures. And we're going to be discussing this, uh, particularly when we talk about histology or when we discuss each of the organs more specifically. Uh, the other type of organ in the digest, or the other types of organs in the digestive system are those that only make brief contact with the food or make no contact with the food or digested food at all, but instead add important, um, important things to the digestive process, things that are, are, are essential to properly di digesting our food. Um, and this is going to be, these are going to be called our accessory organs of digestion. And this is going to include things like the liver and the pancreas and other types of glands um, uh, that are going to uh, largely um, aid in the process of digestion while making no contact or very little contact with the food. So what I'm going to do now is give you a very brief anatomical overview of how food and digested food moves through the digestive system. So let's start with these two pieces of bacon, which is our food. Uh, it's going to enter into the gastrointestinal tract. Uh, by the way, I should point out that the gastrointestinal tract organs are all going to be in green. So these are the organs that make up that gastro or GI tract. So food enters into the oral vestibule, then moves into the oral cavity, uh, it is then swallowed. A fancy word for swallow is deglutition. Uh, it's going to move into the pharynx, uh, where peristalsis will move it into the esophagus. Food will continue uh, moving through the esophagus through uh, uh, into the stomach. Before it gets there, it's going to move through the gastroesophageal sphincter. Uh, and then it will move into the stomach. Uh, it will pass through four areas of the stomach. Food enters the stomach at the cardia, moves through the fundus, body, and then ends in the pylorus. Uh, after it moves through the pylorus, it will exit the stomach through the pyloric sphincter and then move into the small intestine, which is also divided up into uh, three sections. The first section that receives the food from the pyloric sphincter is the duodenum or duodenum depending on how you like to pronounce it. It will then move into the jejunum and then the ileum. Uh, following the ileum, it will move through the ileocecal valve, and once you move through there, you are in the large intestine, which is also divided up into multiple sections. Uh, partially digested food will move through the cecum, ascending colon, transverse colon, descending colon, the sigmoid colon, and then the rectum. Uh, from there, it will make its way into the anal canal, pass through the anal sphincter, and then uh, this, this, uh, the waste will be excreted through the anus, and here's our waste. So these green words are, are the, are the organs here in green are the ones that make up the gastrointestinal tract. So I'm going to show you the accessory organs and how they fit into this. Uh, the accessory organs will be in red. So of course in, uh, in our oral vestibule and oral cavity we have our teeth. The teeth are there for chewing, which is also called mastication. In addition, uh, we have accessory organs, the salivary glands. These salivary glands are going to secrete uh, enzymes that help begin breaking down food. They also help with lubrication, and this is going to be secreted into the oral cavity. Um, another place where accessory organs come into play, specifically the liver and gallbladder, occurs in the small intestine. So the liver creates, uh, makes bile, and this bile is stored in the gallbladder, and it stays there until um, food enters into the small intestine, where it enters into the duodenum. Uh, and then uh, the, the gallbladder is going to 
then secrete bile into the duodenum, and this is going to aid in digestion of fats. Uh, in addition, we have the pancreas that secrete many types of enzymes into the same area. Uh, and there's uh, various enzymes that are secreted, and we'll talk about that later. But they are also there to aid in chemical digestion of the food. The last accessory organ we're going to discuss is the appendix. Now, the appendix, as we know, is a lymphoid organ, um, and how it aids in digestion is not completely clear, uh, considering you can have your appendix removed and there doesn't appear to be really any ill effects. But what we think the appendix may do is provide, um, is act as a storage or storehouse for what we refer to as good bacteria. Um, and they could, it could serve to inject these good bacteria periodically into the large intestine uh, to keep your flora uh, in your GI or, or in your intestine, uh, more swayed to what we, would, what we would consider a good population of bacteria, which is going to aid in proper digestion as well. So next, I'm going to talk a little about a little bit about some organ-specific features, focusing first on organs of the GI tract. So again, organs that make direct contact for lengthy amounts of time with the food. So first, uh, one of the first ones we'll talk about is the pharynx. This is um, I want to talk really about how this aids in swallowing. So there are specific pharyngeal muscles that work with muscles in the oral cavity. Um, that uh, the muscles in the or oral cavity start the swallowing. And ultimately, these are going to work together to push this bolus of food, which is what we call the chewed and moistened food, a bolus. We're going to push that bolus into the esophagus using these muscles. And of course, the esophagus is the tube that's going to transport it to the stomach. So the esophagus is made up of smooth muscles. It does have sphincters, but they are not well defined. They are on either end. And again, it just actively moves ingested materials down toward the stomach. The stomach, of course, is a J-shaped organ where chemical digestion of the food, uh, or a significant amount of chemical digestion of the food takes place. The stomach, one of the features we wanted to point out here is that it's folded into, um, it has folds which are referred to as rugi or rugae. These are what allow the stomach to stretch. So if your stomach is really full and completely distended, you're not going to see as much of these. The small intestine um, is where a significant almost all of the absorption uh, from our digestive process takes place. And so the key for digestion, or I'm sorry, the key for absorption is increased surface area. And there are two major things that the small intestine has uh, that increase the surface area of this organ. So first, the mucosa itself is folded into circular folds called plicae circularis that increase the surface area available to absorb nutrients. And then these folds are folded into fingers called villi that give even more surface area. So just to give you an idea of how significant that is, if there were no folds in the small intestine and we just, we just straightened it out, what we would find is it's about 3.6 uh, square feet. However, with those villi and with those circular folds, the small intestine ends up being somewhere around 2,200 square feet. So these folds and villi, the circular folds and the villi together, increase dramatically increase the amount of surface area uh, there for absorption, allowing us to absorb as much as we can from our digested food. Next, we move on to the large intestine, uh, which is tightened by the tinea E. coli um, into pouches that are called haustra. So the, uh, I want to talk a little bit about our teeth real quick. So teeth, of course, are considered an accessory organ. They, sh they do make direct contact with the food, but only briefly. Uh, our teeth are, of course, on the top and bottom of the oral cavity. The top teeth are complementary to the bottom teeth, and basically the teeth on the left side are a mirror image of the teeth on the right side. Uh, and of course, our teeth can all, all teeth can be divided up into um, similar um, similar parts. Uh, first, we have the enamel. The enamel is a barrier that protects the teeth, uh, but it can be easily damaged by acid. This is why soft drinks um, uh, cause damage to the enamel, as well as the bacteria in our mouth when we eat sweets. That causes those bacteria to produce acid, and this also damages the enamel on our teeth. The enamel is made up of calcium phosphate crystals, and it's formed as the tooth developed. Unfortunately, once it is worn away, it cannot be repaired. 
The next part of the tooth is referred to as dentin. Dentin is this kind of brownish section here in the photo. Dentin is about 45% calcium phosphate or apatite and 33% organic. It's very similar to bone. This is a bone-like substance. It's formed prior to the enamel. Um, but it can be reformed unlike enamel, uh, and it provides a lot of uh, support for the enamel as well. Pulp is the next section. So pulp is shown um, here. This is the innermost area in this picture, the kind of orangey area. You can see there's vascular uh, vascularization in there as well as innervation. It's connective tissue, it is living, and it is formed by odontoblast. This is the living tissue of a tooth, and so what this does is it will sound the alarm when the dentin uh, starts to decay above it, of course, because that means we're getting into a situation where our teeth could be irreparably damaged. So at this point, um, it would be a good idea to move on to the gross anatomy labeling section, which you'll be able to find in Blackboard.